Um, to follow that is uh, a little bit like seeing a spectacular touchdown pass and then fumble the next <laughs> play. So uh, anyway, it's a joy to be here, <coughs> and uh, I very much uh, rejoice at being part of this uh, wonderful uh, fellowship and society. I, uh, I'm glad it's somewhat cooler today and not raining, too. I, it reminds me of a poem that old Dr. Vance Havner, evangelist from years ago, old Dr. Vance Havner, used to say. Um, he said, uh, whether the weather be good or whether the weather be not, whether the weather be cold or whether the weather be hot, whatever the weather, we will weather the weather, whether we like it or not. And so I guess we'll have to do that. But uh, I hope and trust that the Lord uh, is blessing you during these days and will do what he has done for Brother DeVitro, and that is uh, light a fire again and let us get back at it and get back to the work that God has for us to do. It seems largely unacknowledged that the most important issue of the Bible is truth. There can be no compromise regarding the matter of the Bible for Truth uh, compromised uh, equals corruption, and corruption is unreliable. If the Bible is not wholly true, then it cannot be trusted. Amen. For if the Bible be untrue, in part, what man will be worthy to determine what is true and what is not? How can men base their hope of life and eternity upon a book of subjective speculation, ever-changing words? Satan knows this fact, and ever since the days of Adam, he has sought to bring down and uh, bring doubt and lack of faith and trust in the Word of God. Throughout the Christian era, scholars have debated the truths of the Bible. The basis of many debates, which have challenged the literal words, truth, and doctrine of the Bible, uh, of the received text have been initiated because of a lack of belief in the verb, literal verbal inspiration and preservation of the Bible. Apostate Christian scholars who deny God's pre preservation of his words and promote their seriously altered Bibles, like scholars of false religions, which religions base their beliefs upon words foreign to truth, are alike in one undeniable tenet. Bible alterers and scholars of false religions both lack faith to believe that God spoke every word of the Holy Bible and that he has preserved those words in the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic words of the received text from which the authorized King James Bible has been accurately translated into English. The unfortunate result of the unbelief of apostate Christian scholars who do not believe in the inspired, preserved words of God in the received text in totality, and the false religion disciples who decide uh, God's revealed truth of the preserved Christian Bible, which leads men to the Savior, have both in their own way caused the truth of God to be weakened for many and lost to most. And that's literally the truth. Across America today, if you count the number of people who use the King James Bible exclusively or regularly and look at those who use other versions and prefer them, uh, it is becoming a fact that these modern versions are literally uh, taking precedent over the truth. And uh, so we need very much to do all that we can in whatever position we are holding, whether it be a lay leader in the church or a pastor or a teacher or some other individual to try to stem this tide. Many worldly intellectuals, religious skeptics, and careless so-called believers have already decided before they consider the authorized King James Version what they will or will not accept regarding the words of God and want an easy compromised Bible. Misled believers often do not study and pray for discernment when reading the, uh, their altered Bible. And for those who mindlessly follow anyone who is a smooth talker with an academic reputation, truth will be secondary at best 
because popularity rules the day. There seem to be many who talk, write, and teach about the Bible who relish finding some issue or concern which seems impossible to be resolved to their satisfaction. The Pharisees and Herodians who were bitter theological enemies with each other, and you'll find that to be in truth. If you want to unite your church, get your enemies to get together on some issue against you, and you'll find uh, that you'll get them together. They took counsel in Matthew 22 to entangle Jesus in his talk. These two religious elements banded together, and along with the Sadducees, sent some of their best representatives to question Jesus. Now, bear in mind, uh, these were not seeking the truth. These were seeking to make their school of thought superior to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the supposedly indefensible things both religious sects, uh, and all three of them actually, uh, and the popul population at large agreed upon was the matter of Roman taxation upon Israel, which was felt to be religiously wrong for Jews to pay. The Pharisees and Herodians wanted to be able to dispute this civil issue with Jesus and hopefully discredit him with the people while strengthening their own superiority as Bible masters. The scholars felt this issue was a no-win one for Jesus, and their question was this, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Can't you just see them nudge one another when they ask it? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus asked to be shown the tribute money. Jesus was a religious figure. And most of us don't have two pennies to rub together, so he had to ask somebody to show him the money. And when it was produced, ask the questioners. Whose is this image in superscription? Superscription. When the hypocritical questioners, questioners answered Caesar's, Jesus said, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Not to let this truth and wisdom of Jesus stand and the authority of the scholars be bested before the people by Jesus, the Sadducees then asked Jesus a question that they felt sure they could prevail in. The Sadducees did not believe there was any scriptural way that the doctrine of resurrection of the dead could be successfully defended, even by God. The Sadducees were confident that their logic was greater than the truth of scripture, and after all, who could logically believe in the resurrection of the dead? The Sadducees came following uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians with their scriptural conundrum, which they were certain would forever alter theology and prove them superior in textual matters. The point they raised was based upon a hypothetical situation which involved seven brothers, supposedly. One of the seven brothers married and died childless. Each of the other six brothers in turn married the brother number one's wife in succession at the death of each brother in descending order. The brothers failed in their efforts to raise up a child in brother one's name. The Trump question of the Sadducees was this. In the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. The biblical truth the Sadducees wanted to dispel was that of the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead and wanted the doctrine discredited. The Bible-altering factions, too, have some agenda. I have said this for a number of years. Uh, there's no reason, no need to try to build a text out of an altered, corrupt, worthless, critical text manuscript. The only reason anybody would want to do it would either be to build a name for themselves or to make money or to dispel some truth. There's, there's no good reason to do it. And Jesus' answer was powerfully triumphant. Ye do err, my goodness, to say that to a scholar. Hmm, don't know what you're talking about. Not knowing the scriptures. I know some, I know some folks that didn't finish the sixth grade that know the Bible from one end to the other Amen. and know more about the truth of God than some of these people coming out of the seminaries and schools. My goodness. And not only do they know it, they believe it. 
Oh, that's another point. Ye do err not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Let me stop there just a second. The angels of God in heaven. Now, I don't, I don't know where that would lead, but he, he made a definite statement about the angels. He said the angels of God in heaven, not the fallen angels. Uh, that's a whole other subject, whether or not you understand the Nephilim to be uh, some kind of a fallen spirit being or not. I don't know, and I'm not capable of necessarily finding out, but God identified them as those in heaven, they're not, they're not marriage material. And so the ones fallen, he, he made such a clear distinction that there has to be some sort of a truth to be followed up on that. The angel of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, ye have, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians, for their own purposes, were trying to destroy the words of God and thereby the doctrines of God. The persistent claim of the Westcott and Hort purveyors of altered Bibles is that there are no biblical doctrines affected by the word changes and omissions in the new versions. However, just as the Pharisees, Herodians, and Sadducees were intent in bringing Scripture to heal according to their own purposes, so are modern-day scholars doing the same. The scholars who questioned Jesus cared nothing for Him, and for them the Bible was their domain and subject to their interpretation and or alteration as it suited them and their purposes. It seems to be so with the critical text new version supporting scholars today. Dr. Jack Mormon has found and documented in his writings regarding the textual and manuscript issues 356 doctrines affected by the word changes and omissions in modern Bible versions. In his book, Forever Settled, Dr. Mormon was... Uh, has also exposed the arrogant and high-minded way modern Bible scholars alter and dismiss the preserved text, while having little respect for the people at large who are eternally affected by the altering efforts which he quotes. And he quotes Dr. Stuart Custer in that light. Uh, Dr. Custer is a now-retired member of the Bible Department of Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, who's writing on, who in his writing on page 16 of his book, The Truth of the King James Controversy, the following quote, The believer may safely leave such problems, i.e., the transmission of the text, to the discussion of theological experts. Now, if you believe that, you're in serious trouble. I've got one over here that I have all the confidence in the world in, but I'll take the King James any day. Love him. The faith and eternal peace of the people who hoped in the law of God and the resurrection were of no interest to the scholars in Jesus' day. And the scholars today sound like those elitist, privileged, acumens, sick, who care nothing for the simple truth that the authorized King James Version uh, Bible is God's inspired words accurately translated into English and is preserved for all eternity. These deceived doubters forget that the Holy Spirit reveals the truths of God's words to those simple folks, my words, whom Dr. Custer thinks should wait around his door while he decides what God has and what he has not said and what he meant and what he should have said. The Pope and his priests have held the same position in uh, this condescending opinion of scholars, old and new. It seems that the scholars in Jesus' day were trying to build a name for them and be held in all for besting Jesus about the words and doctrines of the Bible. While Dr. Custer is no doubt a fine and decent man, he appears to be 
uh, of the same age old bent of those who have doubted God's power to preserve what he has inspired and promised to keep uh, and keep inviolate. And Dr. Custer is wrong on this point. The above challenge by the theologians of the day of Jesus in a, uh, in a very simple yet powerful way stated the truth of the theological matter by demonstrating the truthfulness and trustworthiness of the Old Testament text. Jesus proved with the word am that God is the God of the living, thereby proved the doctrine of resurrection. And that's the simple truth. Inspiration and preservation in the Bible um, of the issue regarding the new and altered versions of the Bible. Uh, inspiration and uh, preservation is the heart of the issue uh, regarding the new and altered versions of the Bible. There is no other basis for debate. The Bible is a living book, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, but not in the sense many Supreme Court justices believe the Constitution of the, uh, the United States is a living document. And for those who may be recording this for future co uh, conviction of a crime, let me just be sure they understand what I'm saying. Amen. <laughs> uh, the Supreme Court of this country has absolutely departed from the Constitution Amen. Amen. and is now a rogue entity uh, super, super, uh, supervised, I think, by a rogue president. K.R. Rainey. 421 Tanyard Road, Greenville, South Carolina, 29609. My lawyer is Christian Spencer. <laughs> Bible for the Day Presbyterian Church, Collingswood, New Jersey. <laughs> Might not be for long, yeah. Okay, back to the matter at hand. Uh, there's a growing popular thought among the justices of the Supreme Court and indeed among the growing, a no, growing number of citizens that the Constitution should constantly change with the times and whims of the people. While that is a possibility for, the document, for a document as precious as the Constitution, it is not, according to God, a possibility for, the word, uh, for God's words. The words of God will not morph or be altered by vote of a panel or society's consensus. Amen. For every word, for forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Yeah. The Bible in its preserved Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic words of the received text is the absolute and final word of Almighty God. Amen. It is arrogant and presumptive to think or imply a need for or attempt to alter what God has said will endure forever. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. That, too, is a simple truth. The text issue is old as Satan's text issue in Genesis. The prophet Jeremiah had to deal with the prophets of his day who wanted to change the true prophecies of God for a more appealing message. Jeremiah was led of God to, to confront the message changers, and he said this in part in, in that confrontation. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Not many of these today who preach can say such words as that because they don't really know what God said if they're not using the King James Bible. So you don't hear it very much anymore. Hearken not unto the words of the prophets who prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say, "Steal unto them." Uh, they say, "Steal unto them that despise me." The Lord saith, uh, uh, the, "The Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace." That's what they say. These false prophets, and they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, "No evil shall come upon you." That's what they say today. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard His word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall 
fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed and until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Jeremiah 23, 16 to 22. Again, the prophet hath a dream. Let him tell a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Jeremiah twenty three twenty eight. The Lord at last declared concerning the perversion of his word in Jeremiah's day, Ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Jeremiah twenty three thirty six b Changing the words of God in his message, brings God's wrath upon those who alter the words and those misled by the altered words. This textual matter which has become a runaway epidemic will doubtless come to the same confusing state as it did in the Jer- in day of Jeremiah and with the same tragic results. For years after the death of the Apostle John, Uh, The church, because of its love for and belief in the inspired words of God, endured persecution after persecution before it finally was to possess an accurate and preserved text Bible compiled from pieces, fragments, and some larger manuscripts portions gleaned from the hands of hiding places of God's people by men called and prepared for the task. This was indeed a work of God. Such men as Beza and Erasmus were used uh, to gather the, uh, gather the fragments of the Word of God. And the Hebrew uh, Old Testament and Greek New Testament was finally available in unified form. Others then wanted the Bible in English language for those who were, unlike the wealthy, only marginally educated at best. And thus the work to translate the Bible into English began. Most of the translators were burned at the stake for their efforts. The Catholic Church, always the opponent of the true Bible and and antagonist of the church, uh, antagonist of those endeavoring to have a true and pure Bible in the language of the people, put countless thousands, in in fact millions to death, uh, in their attempt to keep the unaltered Bible of the received text, which is not, the Catholic Bible of the critical text, from being translated into English and thereby out of the hands of the masses. Without God's preserved words in the language of the people, the masses were at the mercy of a false religion. The Catholic Church knew it and knew it would lose its power and control over men if they learned the simple truth. As he spake these words, many believed on him, then said Jesus to, the, to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Catholic Church knows that, opposes the King James Bible. It is a widely known and undeniable fact that the Jesuit order has made great efforts to supplant the authorized King James Bible. Jesuits, the Pope's a Jesuit now, did you know that? That's just in passing. I wouldn't hurt his feelings for anything. But the Pope's a Jesuit. Jesuits are ruthless and determined opponents of the uh, authorized King James Bible and will stop at nothing, even murder. And they have to remove the authorized King James Bible from the hands of men. Jesuits have earned advanced degrees from respected schools and thereby have gained a platform in many formerly fundamental colleges, universities, and seminaries. In the last hundred years, Jesuit educated infiltrators and their influenced and deceived students have succeeded in turning schools of higher learning and thereby the pastors, teachers, graduating from them, into opponents of the authorized King James Bible. 
intellectual pride is Satan's key that has enabled him to steal the true words of God from a once strong and evangelistic church. The simple truth is that the unaltered words of God accurately translated into any language will set people spiritually free, free from ignorance, superstition, and false religions, and free from the chains of sin, death, spiritual domination, and the grip of Satan. Spiritual freedom comes from believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. Saving faith requires the very words of God, not the altered words men choose. So then, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Without the preserved words of God, salvation will become virtually impossible to obtain, for true faith must be based upon the very words of God. And God will preserve those words always, but men can be caused not to trust them by the efforts of Bible changers. Doubt, which is unbelief spelled differently, has long challenged God's words. Even while Paul was alive, establishing churches, pinning God's words to the church, and thereby writing large portions of the New Testament, and there were already agents of Satan writing bogus letters and sending bogus messengers to the churches which were spreading false doctrine, confusion, and doubt. These satanic letters were being signed with Paul's name. So serious was the problem that Paul wrote these inspired words to the churches of Galatia. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that Ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6 to 9. It is clear to me that God uh, moved Paul to write for a time in which he lived an unimaginable warning. Paul's warning centered upon the alteration of the words of the gospel, that is, that is the God, uh, words of God. The warning was, though someone who looked like Paul or his missionaries God forbid that he should change his message and doctrine and come to them with it or an angel from heaven or uh, with any other gospel, words uh, of God. Let them be accursed because Paul knew how easily men can be deceived. Also, he was not so arrogant that he couldn't think he could be deceived in the future. Therefore, believers must heed these urgent words. Earnestly, this is for the church now. This isn't for scholars. This isn't for preachers. This is for the church. Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There are now many compromised preachers and teachers who once stood for the preserved authorized King James Bible. They don't say publicly that they've changed their position on the Bible. Did you know a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie? Amen. And a preacher that will mislead people and make them think they, oh, I love the King James Bible. It is so beautiful. I have learned, that is the Bible I have memorized. Oh, I wouldn't take anything from my King James Bible. Now, this is what the King James said. It would be better to say... Yeah. It should have said, it could have said, and maybe would have said, if God had known better. That's Correcting it in the pulpit, you see. Misleading people. Yes. Liars. Amen. They talk about how much they love the authorized King James Bible. But they work in their new beliefs and deceive the trusting hearers. A pastor, uh, I better not call his name. It's not that I wouldn't mind calling his name. I don't mind confronting him, but I don't want to be sued. <laughs> well, I don't mind being sued. I don't have anything to lose. But 
I don't have the money to hire. Well, we'll talk after the meeting. <laughs> a pastor near where I live reportedly said to his people, and one of his people told me about this, um, told one of his people that the King James Bible was too difficult for him to understand even though he could read philosophy books translated from Greek with no trouble. <laughs> He's leading his church to use a horribly altered version and these Bible changers will give an account to God, uh, to the God they claim to be serving for compromising God's words and leading men into error. May God deliver us from the work of deceived teachers and preachers. And oh God, help me not to be so arrogant that I ever get away from a close walk from you. Because in my foolishness, oh God, I too can be deceived. And Lord, Lord, keep us from error, I do pray. He can do it, you know. All right. Um, I want to read... Uh, Psalm 119, verse 49 following. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night and have kept thy law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. Thank you very much, Pastor Rennie. An excellent message from the Word of God. Amen. Uh, Pastor Demetrius is going to lead us in a song, and we're going to stand and prepare ourselves before our next speaker comes. So go right ahead. Before we, before we get to a song, we're going to in just a minute. But one, one, one by one, as you stand up to, to, to sing the song, why don't we introduce each other? Again, it's, it's early in the morning. We have all day to fellowship, and it's terrible to say hey you to everybody. So let's start over here. Uh, you, would you stand up, introduce yourself, and then turn to hymn number 626. When we're all up, we'll sing it. Amen.
Sharon Nikimian, Watertown, Massachusetts. Amen. This is my daughter Emily. Okay. <coughs> Jean Rodenheiser, and we're together from the uh, Baptist Bible Believers Baptist in uh, Sharon, uh, Stoke, Mass. Okay. Good to have you. Claire Gibson from the same church, Believers Baptist Church. Praise the Lord. Chris Spiderman from Franklin, Mass. Amen. Christian Spencer, Bible Presbyterian Church, Collingswood, New Jersey. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Wu. Uh, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm a church member of Dr. Wade. Okay. And I'm so, so happy to be here this morning. Amen. <laughs> We're happy you're happy. I'm David Cooper, Bible Baptist Church, Maryland, Georgia. And this is my wife, Judith. Dad is back there with his headphones on. He probably doesn't know what we're doing. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we are thrilled to have you here at Grace Baptist Church. And I'd like you to turn to 626, that first verse. I have found it.